Welcome back to Codex. Throughout the summer, Codex is featuring graduate students and postdocs who were nominated to speak by their senior colleagues. Today, we're pleased to have Josue Tonelli Cueto as the first speaker in this series. Josue is currently a postdoc at UT San Antonio, and in the fall, he'll start another postdoc at Johns Hopkins. Today, he'll tell us about condition numbers and probability for explaining algorithms. Take it away, Josue. Oh, thank you very much for the introduction, Dustin. And um, thank you very much uh, for the invitation and the chance to speak. So let me uh, start with maybe a little bit of a small story. So in this story, on the one hand, we have Turin. So the father of computing, as some people know him. And then we have uh, James Wilkinson, which is the father of numerical analysis in certain sense. Okay, so in this story, we are in 1946, and we are at the National Physics Laboratory, which is around Manchester. It's not exactly Manchester. Yeah? And this is the kind of computers that they will have at the, at the time. So this is more or less four years afterwards. So this is not exactly the computer. This is a later version of a better computer that they had, that what they had at the time. So then they were working there and then they have like a certain problem arrive. So however, it happened that sometime after my arrival, a system of 18 equation arrived in mathematics division. And after talking around it for some time, we finally decided to abandon theorizing and to solve it. A system of 18 is surprisingly formidable, even when one had, has previously experienced with 12, and we accordingly decided on a joint effort. So we can see at the time, a system of 18 equ linear equations was really like a R computing issue. So what is the method that they decided to do? So Wilkinson, during the Second World War, at some moment, he decided to use Gaussian elimination um, so that it more or less worked. But since this was during the Second World War, he didn't go and research on it because they had other things to do while he was uh, there. So at that time, so Wilkinson, in a more pragmatic side, was like, OK, this worked before. Maybe we should try it. But then Turing, on the other hand, uh, was uh, relying on some of the pessimistic bounds at the time that were saying that Gaussian elimination was not good, was against using Gaussian elimination, believing that it will not actually work to solve the linear system. So there was some kind of uh, discussion about it. So Turing was saying that Gaussian elimination will not work. And then, OK, uh, Wilkinson, and he was the leader of the team, he decided just to, OK, to go ahead with Gaussian elimination with complete pivoting and do the computation anyway. I mean, as you can see, this scroll is like uh, arguing against a genius at the time. This probably should not have been easy at the time, but okay, they went ahead and it succeeded. So then in the words of Wilkinson, so I suppose this must be regarded as a defeat for Turing since he at the time was a keener adherent than any other of the rest of us to the pessimistic school. So of course, Turing was a little bit puzzled by this. So he started to think about it. And then later on will appear this paper by Turing, rounding off errors in matrix processes, where he in a certain way developed and invented the condition number that we will see later. So in the words of uh, Wilkinson himself, the second round undoubtedly went to Turing. So all this story with the whole detail, you can find it at the 1970 Turing lecture by Wilkinson, uh, where you can find all the remaining of the, of the text of the story, which is pretty nice to read. Okay, so in this case, we have an algorithm that was a pessimistic estimate. Then they tried in practice and it happened to work. And then Turing came up with a way of explaining what it happened by developing the notion of condition number. So then the question that we are here trying to answer, or at least introducing some generality is, why do some, why do some algorithms perform better than predicted? Okay, 
Now here I want to say that this is not an isolated phenomenon. So another famous case in which this happens is the simplex method. So in this problem, we are asked to solve a linear programming. So this means we want to maximize a certain linear function defined over a convex polytope, which is usually given by a matrix A times X less or equal than some vector component wise. And uh, here, the method that uh, usually was invented the first time was invented by Danzig in 1947, after a long series of process, where then at some moment he realized that one of the open problems that he solved, thinking that it was a homework question, because he arrived later to the class, was useful for developing this. So that's another story that is quite interesting, but no time for it. But he developed the simplex method, and this was very efficient in practice. And then the question was, why? Even more, there are several uh, problems for which the original simplex methods will perform badly. And even later on, something like called the ellipsoid method was developed that showed that linear programming can be done in polynomial time. However, when you try to implement the ellipsoid method, it really does not outperform the simplex methods in practice. So then we have to wait more than 50 years in order to get a justification that was done by Spielman and Teng using the smoothed analysis, which I will later introduce it. Okay, so now let's focus to the complexity of algorithms. So in the complexity of traditional algorithms, we usually have some input then we want to obtain to solve some problem with this input. So then we develop an algorithm that does some operations on this input and gives us an output that solves the problem. Usually when one goes in the first courses of algorithms and one wants to study the complexity of an algorithm, we do a kind of a worst case form of complexity estimate. So we look at the runtime of the algorithm on an input and we want to bound it in terms exclusively of the size of the input. And this is kind of pessimistic in the sense I'm bounding all inputs of a given size by the same bound. And here uh, we should say that sometimes size uh, has several parameters. So number of variables, degree. So size might not be used one parameter. We might have several parameters of size. Okay. This is in the, let's say, traditional algorithms. But then when we go to the numerical world, we are not given an exact input. Our input is inexact, affected by maybe the measurement errors, other kind of errors, or even that I had to truncate some algebraic number that I have to input in the, in the algorithm. Then I will use a numerical algorithm that importantly uses inexact operations. And then performing this in exact operations, I will only obtain an inexact output. So in general, so I start with something inexact, I do inexact things in the middle, and then I obtain an inexact output, which is an approximate solution to my problem. So when we look at these algorithms and we try to analyze in this worst case uh, paradigm, then we have that this fails. It fails because there are inputs for which arbitrarily small errors will give us radical changes in the output. So these inputs means that we cannot really treat all the inputs in a uniform way in terms of the size. So paraphrasing uh, Orwell in Animal Farm, we can say that all inputs of the same size are equal, but some inputs are more equal than others. And then uh, this is where come condition numbers come into play. So we have the condition number of an input. This is a measure of numerical sensitivity of the input. So what do we mean by this? Is that if the condition number is big, then small variations of the input will lead up to big variations of the output. So then I have to be very careful of what I do with the input because a small error will uh, multiply a lot in the output size. And if the condition number is small, then reasonably decent variations of the input will still be reasonable size variations of the output. So I will not have to worry too much about the errors. I can worry less about the errors. 
And here uh, it's important to make an important remark is that the condition number is not a property of the algorithm, but it's a property of the computational problem that we are studying. So this no matter the algorithm that you have, the condition number is not really measuring something about the algorithm, but it's measuring something about how errors behave for your problem. Okay, so going back maybe to the st uh, story of Turing and Wilkinson, we have the Turing condition number, which is probably known uh, by everyone here, where you are given a matrix, and then you just take the norm of the matrix multiplied by the norm of the inverse matrix. And this is usually the condition number. And then this allows us to control the errors in a linear system in the sense that approximately the relative error in the solution is uh, the condition number times the relative error of the matrix and the relative error of the constant vectors. So, okay, this is a way in which condition numbers comes, at least in this linear system case. And then with this, usually what we can do is to do a kind of a condition-based complexity. So we want to understand the runtime of the algorithm at that input. And instead of bounding this exclusively in terms of the size of the input, we also bound this in terms of the condition number of the input. So this allows us to understand when the algorithm performs well with certain inputs and why the algorithm performs badly with other inputs. It will depend not only on the size, but also on the condition number. But now, when you look at a certain problem, you many times are not interested in understanding how the problem behaves at each particular input, but you want to get some understanding of how the algorithm behaves in general. So we want some kind of general understanding of the algorithm. And then the question is, can we have a complexity estimate of a numerical algorithm only depending on size? So where it does not depend on the condition number, which sometimes is difficult to interpret. And the way that you do this is randomizing your input. So we go from random input and with a random input, we can obtain a probabilistic complexity estimate. But now, this is an important warning. How do we randomize the input? Because of course, one can go and say, yeah, I take a path input with probability one. That's my random input. Then of course, one should be here careful of giving enough freedom, but not restricting it too much, which kind of distributions we choose, with the kind of distributions we avoid, et cetera, et cetera. And then this is important to notice that the choice mainly depends on the context in which you are. So this is not a choice that you can always do in a canonical way, but sometimes you have to be uh, sensitive to the context in which you are trying to explain the performance of the algorithm. And depending on the context, you will choose one probability distribution or another. Okay, so then we come to the probabilistic complexity because once we have a random input, we look at the runtime of a random input of size at most S, and then I can look at its probability distribution. So I can look about the probability that this input is greater than T, and then I can bound this in terms of the size and in terms of T. Of course, as T becomes larger, this F of ST will become smaller and smaller and smaller. And then if we are lucky, we can get maybe a simpler looking bound by just computing the expectation. Because it might happen that even though you can give bounds on the probability, it might still happen that the expectation is infinite. So one should be careful with, with this because you don't always have an expectation of the runtime. Okay, so this is one way of saying, okay, I take a random input and I look at it. But there is a particular way of randomizing that has become uh, pretty useful for explaining algorithms which is called the smoothed complexity. So this is how Spielman and Tang explain the success of the simplex method. So again, we look at the runtime of the algorithm that are input, but now I don't look only at the input, but I look at the input plus some noise. So I have some noise and then Sigma here represents the magnitude of the noise. So if Sigma is small, the noise is small. If Sigma is big, then the noise is big. And then I look at the probability of this 
runtime with respect to random noise. And then I take the supremum over all inputs of a given size. So essentially looking at arbitra an arbitrary input of a given size, and then I apply in random noise to this, and I want to bound this quantity. And of course the bound will depend on the size, on the T, and on the magnitude of the noise, the sigma. And then again, if we are lucky enough, then we can just bound the expectation of this for an arbitrary input of size S, and we have this. So when thinking about the smoothed complexity, one should think that this is a very realistic model in the sense that usually in practice, you are given some concrete input. So the input many times is not produced at random, but what usually you assume that has some randomness inside is the maybe the measurement errors. So if this input comes from some practical application, yeah, you're measuring a concrete thing, but then when you are trying to measure this thing, there are some random errors in all the numbers that you obtain. And in this sense, the smoothed uh, complexity is a more realistic approach than the, you say, probabilistic complexity in general. Because in practice, usually you get a fixed input affected by some errors, and then you want to handle this input in all the cases. Okay, some another reason why smoothed complexity is kind of nice is because when you look at the smoothed complexity estimate, and then you make the sigma goes to zero, so the noise is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller, then you get the worst case form of the complexity estimate. But if you make the other way around, if you make the noise become as bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, then the deterministic part disappears at all, completely, and then you get kind of a probabilistic form of the complexity estimate. So in a certain way, the smoothed complexity has a nice thing that is like between the worst case and the probabilistic case. So the input is not fully randomized and the input is not fully deterministic. It's like something in between, some mixture of the two. And this can be made precise by just saying that if the magnitude of the noise goes to zero, you get the worst case estimate. And if the magnitude of the noise goes to infinity, then you just get a normal probabilistic estimate with respect a random input. Okay. Of course, I will not go through all the details, which uh, there is a lot of many subtopics here that you can find. And a good reference for this is this book, Condition, by Peter Burgesser and Felipe Cooker. Uh, here in this book, you can find um, all about these linear systems, also about the linear programming, although it's not so focused on the simplex method, but more another, an alternative method known as the interior point method, and then also systems of polynomial equations. But instead of trying to go through all the examples in the small amount of time that I have, I want to focus in a very concrete case, which is called the Descartes solver for finding real roots of real univariate polynomials. So I will just focus on this concrete case to try to illustrate the phenomenon with a little more of technicality on it. Okay, so this is joint work with Elias Chigaridas and Alpre Nergur. This is a picture of some Zoom meeting where we were working on this. And what's the problem that we have here? So this is the problem of real root isolation. This is a very fundamental problem. And this is also a very easy to understand problem. So we are given as input a univariate polynomial. Let's assume that the coefficients are integer coefficients. And then as output, I want a family of intervals. And then the properties that I want these intervals to satisfy is that the endpoint of these intervals are rational so that I can encode them in a computer. Then I want that the zero real zero set of my polynomial is containing the union of intervals. So that is every root of my polynomial is containing some of the intervals. And then I want that each interval contains at most one root. So in a certain way, each interval contains a unique root. And I know that for each interval, there is a unique root inside. So I know now I have my roots well separated and isolated. And here, the, what are the input size parameters that we look? So this is an integer polynomial. Usually there are two parameters. One of them is the degree which roughly is the number of coefficients. 
And then the other one is the bit size of the coefficients. So how many bits of information I use to write my coefficients. And here the important thing to notice is that the measure of the runtime that I will use, since everything here is kind of in a usual model of complexity, we can use speak about bit complexity. So we don't have to use any more sophisticated version. Even though here I'm doing this case, I want to point that we can do the, also this with continuous inputs, where instead of having integer coefficients, we have real coefficients. But uh, you know, explaining how you measure the complexity there, making this precise, et cetera, is a little bit more complicated. So because of this, I will focus on the integer case, which is a lot easier to use to understand because it has less technicalities. Okay. So now let's introduce the Descartes solver before going into the state of the art of the problem. Let's see what is the algorithm that we are trying to understand. So the rule of signs. So if I'm given a polynomial, I look at the number of sign variations of the sequence of coefficients. So if I have plus, plus, minus, plus, then there has been two changes. One that passes from pluses to a minus, and then another from a minus to a plus. When I do this number of sign variations, I ignore all the coefficients that are zero. So the coefficients that are zero, I ignore them. I only care when I pass from positive to negative and when I pass from negative to positive. And then I count how many of these changes there has been. Then this is a very old observation going back to René Descartes himself, is that if you look at the polynomial, then the number of positive zeros of this polynomial is at most the number of sign variations of the polynomial. An easy case of this is that if all the coefficients of a polynomial are positive, so the number of sign variations is zero, then it's easy to see that if you put any positive number in the variable, then you get positive times positive, positive, positive plus positive, positive, and then this will never become zero. So this is an easy case. Of course, the general case is slightly harder to prove. And then another thing that one can prove uh, quite easily is that if the number of sign variations is less or equal than one, so if it is zero or if it is one, then you have an equality. So if it is zero, then you don't have no positive zeros. If it is one, then you have exactly one positive zero. And then we have the corollary that we can extend this from zero infinity to any other interval. In order to do this, we just take the canonical way, a rational bijection between zero infinity and any interval. Then we do a change of variable of our polynomial in such a way that we get a new polynomial that the number of zeros in zero infinity of the new polynomial is just the number of zeros of the original polynomial in the interval a, b. And then I just count the number of sign variations of this new polynomial. And then I get this general form of the, of the, of the corollary. Okay, so now let's see how we can use this uh, sign variation and this kind of generalization of how I count in any interval in order to find uh, the roots of a polynomial. So imagine that we start with, uh, I want to find the positive roots of this third degree polynomial. So two x is two x to the cube minus nine x squared plus 12 x minus six. We can see that we have positive, negative, positive, negative. So there are three changes. So we know by the car rule of science that this polynomial has at most three positive roots. So now I do the splitting. So by considering, by changing the variable from x to x plus one, I'm focusing on the interval one infinity, and then I get a new polynomial that is minus one minus three x squared plus two x to the cube. Notice here that one of the coefficients is zero, but the, I don't care. I just ignore the zero coefficients. And then this is negative, negative, positive. So there is one change of variation. So then I know that there is one root in the interval one infinity. Now I go to the other guy. So then I substitute x divided by x plus one, and then I multiply by x plus one to the cube to still have a polynomial. And then when I look at this, I get uh, minus six, minus six x, minus three x squared, minus x to the cube. 
So negative, 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 negative. There is no change of variable. So then I can ignore this branch. There are no positive zeros in the interval zero one. So now I look at one infinity and then I do the same thing again. So I look at two infinity and I say, oh, I get minus two plus three X squared plus two X to the cube minus zero plus plus, which is minus plus plus because I ignore the zero coefficient. So this one change of variable. So I know that the, that the zero is into infinity. Notice that I know that there is at most one zero in one infinity because there was one uh, sign change. So then when I look at the other interval, I just get all negative coefficients. So I don't get an extra count. And then I go down and then I get that now in the interval three infinity, I get all the coefficients positive. So I know that there are no positive roots there. And when I go to two, three, I get one sign change. Of course, you can continue this and then we will get a smaller and a smaller and a smaller interval where the, where the root is contained. If we look what are the real roots of this polynomial, it happens that they only have one real root, which is 2.677, et cetera, which is precisely the interval to three. So we can use this in order to be refining and finding smaller intervals where a root is contained. So this is how we will use the rule of signs. So we are computing the sign variations. We look at the new polynomial. We look at the signs. And we will refine according to whether I have more than one sign variation. And if I got one, I can just do refinements in order to get a smaller and a smaller interval. So now let's make this a little bit more formal. But before that, just think, why is this a good idea algorithmically? So one of the properties of the card uh, Oracle of this the card rule of signs is that it's always overcounting. It always overcounts. So the number of real roots in an interval is always less or equal than the number of sign variations. So I never, I never undercounted the number of roots in an interval. And then it has certain exactness. So when I read one or zero, I know that this is the amount of roots that there are in this interval. If I got two, it might be that there are less. And then there is a second form of exactness is that when I look at the number of complex zeros in a disk that contains the interval, so I take a disk that is slightly bigger than my interval and I look at it, and then I look at the number of complex zeros. If this number of complex zeros is less or equal than K, then the number of sign variations will be less or equal than K. So in a certain way that the car rule of signs is not only counting the real zeros in an interval, it's like seeing the complex zeros around. This can be made very precise. And this is what are called as Overskov uh, theorem. And essentially we can just roughly say that the car sees the complex roots around the interval. So I have some complex roots and this is why the, the car rule of signs is not exact because it has the complex influences. So if you have complex roots that are very near to the interval, then you will see that the, the car rule of science doesn't decrease, but it's because those roots are very near the count that we are making. And then the last part, and this is pretty important because if you realize in the previous example, I started with three sign variations, then I got zero and one, and then I was always getting zero and one, zero and one. And this is something important because if writing that I divide the algorithm, I split the interval and before I had one sign variation and then I had in total two sign variations. Then, okay, it might happen that I use goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down, and then I, I never finish. And this is why the subadity is important is that if I have a disjoint union of intervals that is contained into another interval, then the addition of the sign variations that they get in each one of the intervals is at most the original number of sign variations. So whenever I do this splitting of intervals, I know that the total count that the car gives you will, will, will never go up. So if I had three sign variations, I know that three is the most that I will get when, I'm, when I divide. So if one of them I get three, then in the other one I have to get zero. So this is a very important property because all this allows us to tell if we subdivide and we subdivide, at some moment we will terminate. 
as long as there are no uh, double roots, etc. But this is something that we can always force it uh, pretty easily by considering the GCD of the two polynomials. But okay, this is the thing. So then what does the algorithm does? We use subdivider interval until all intervals that the car rule of science gives us either zero or one. Then I know that in all the intervals that I have, either there is no root or either there is a unique root. Okay, so if my family of intervals is non-empty, then I take a interval in this family, I subtract it for the original family, and then I can put, I compute the number of sign variations on this interval. If I get zero, okay, I throw away the interval. I don't care about it because there are no roots there. If the number is one, then I add this to my intervals that contains a unique root, and I go back to the beginning. And if it is bigger than one, then I split the interval. Then I add the new two intervals to my collection of intervals to check S. And then I check the middle point. If it, the middle point is a zero, then I add it to my family of isolated intervals. Here we have been lucky, and then we found an exact zero. Or if it is not zero, then I will just throw away this middle point. And then I just continue this loop once and again and again until the S is empty. And then I use output set, which will be a family of intervals where each interval contains a unique root and all the roots is contained, every root is contained in some of the intervals in set. Okay, so this is the algorithm. And now let's go back to the state of the art. So if we look in the worst case paradigm, what is the state of the art? So we have the storm solver is similar to the card in a certain way, but a slightly more complicated to, to do the inner computations in it. Then we get that the bit complexity. So here this O should be tilde. You should think about this, that this is the bit complexity ignoring logarithmic factors. So all the logarithms of the degree, all the logarithms of tau, I use ignore them, all these multiplicative factors. I only care about the polynomial part. Why I don't care about the logarithmic factors is because when you run these algorithms, the logarithmic factors also depend on the implementation that you choose. If you choose one implementation or another, you will get an extra logarithmic factor or a lower logarithmic factor. So looking at these logarithmic factors is not so interesting because from the implementation point of view, they are not so important. It, they are very highly implementation dependent. Then we look at our uh, hero of the stock, the Descartes solver, and then we get the same. So the car solver, even though it is slightly simpler, the worst case complexity is the same as the Strum solver, d to the four tau square. Then the champion nowadays is what is called Pan's algorithm developed in 2002, where we can get d square, Remember that this is the degree and then times tau, which is the bit size of the coefficient. However, Pan's algorithm, even though it's the best theoretical algorithm for solving this problem, all its implementations are really bad and they actually are not able to perform properly. If you want an algorithm that actually works, then you have to go to the Anil Descartes developed by Sagralov and Melhorn and this plus some heuristics developed together with Fabrice Roulier are the ones that are implemented in MAPLE. So if you look at MAPLE and you look, there is this kind of version in the background for solving univariate polynomials. This is called a new Descartes. So the new is Newton and DSC means Descartes. So it's kind of a combination of the two. You use Descartes to do the initial subdivision and then you use Newton to obtain refinements of the of the roots as to, as, up to the precision you need them. And then this algorithm takes d to the cube plus d squared tau. So then if the bit complexity of the coefficients is sufficiently big, then this d to the cube dies out, and then you just get d squared tau. So then this algorithm has a kind of a runtime that is comparable to Pan's algorithm. Okay, so this is the one in practice, but even though all this, then a big question here is, okay, but what is the complexity that we wish? Can we do better than d squared tau? In other words, can we beat the champion? 
either the practical champion or either the, the pants algorithm in theory. So this is always a good question to always ask, what's the complexity we wish for a problem? What is the endpoint that one wants? And this is the endpoint. So the endpoint is that the complexity up to logarithmic factors should be d times tau. Notice that if you look at the polynomial of degree d, where each coefficient has bit size tau, then the bit size of this, of this polynomial is d times tau, because d roughly, so the plus one is the number of coefficients, and then each coefficient requires tau bits in order to be stored. So d tau is essentially the amount of speed that I need for reading the polynomial. I read the first coefficient, second coefficient, that's the amount. So then another way of reformulating this is that we wish to find the real roots almost as fast as we read the polynomial. So up to logarithmic factors, we want to be as good as reading a polynomial as we are as finding the real roots. So now one looks at this, and then we I wonder, okay, are we being pessimistic? Because when you implement all these algorithms in practice, even though the complexity estimate for the car solver is as bad as a storm, it happened that the car solver seems to behave faster in practice. So you look at it and you're like, hmm, looks like it behaves a lot better than we predict how it behaves. So then, of course, the question that we wonder is, OK, why does this happen? Why does not the worst complexity estimate that we have actually predict the performance of the algorithm? And here comes a spoiler. And the reason underlying this practical performance of the card is that the card is almost optimal on average. OK, so what do we mean by this? So the first thing is, Instead of considering the worst case complexity, we go to this probabilistic method. So we look at the cost of the solver, F, we consider the moments, and then we compute the expectations of this. And this will be our measure of complexity. We look at the expected, at, at the expected runtime of the solver. And then here the main question, and this is the, the hard thing to justify, is what is a good random model for F? So F is an integer polynomial. There are many ways in I can choose a random poly, a random integer polynomial at random. And this is really a difficult choice to make. And you have to, to try to see if you can get something reasonable and at the same time flexible. Because as I said before, one can say, yeah, I take uh, the worst polynomial ever to solve. I choose this with probability one. That technically is a random polynomial, but it seems like cheating in a certain way. Okay, so we have this, and now let's go to the random model. So we start with a random polynomial. So let's look at the easiest case that one thinks. Okay, I take a random polynomial, and what I do is I choose the coefficients at random. And I choose all the coefficients in the same way. I choose an integer of bit size tau. So in other words, I choose an integer between minus two to the tau and two to the tau. Remember that the size of a, the bit size of an integer is the logarithm of the absolute, absolute value of that integer. Because that's the number of ciphers you need to write the integer. Okay, and in this simple model, the simple main theorem becomes that the expected cost of the car at this algorithm is bounded by t squared plus theta. Okay, this is pretty good because Notice that if tau is sufficiently big, the d square uh, summand, we can ignore it. And this is why we say that the card is almost optimal because you know up to a certain size of tau, this becomes almost optimal of complexity t tau. But okay, this is one, this is the, you know, this most simple version and one can say, oh, but what happens if my integer polynomial just happens to be odd numbers? It doesn't have even numbers as coefficients. I only get odd numbers. Or what happens if some specific coefficients are positive? Or what happens if I don't have the term x to the cube? You know, one can wonder because maybe in the situation where you are, a certain monomial does not appear. Maybe certain coefficients have a specific sign. Maybe some coefficients satisfy a certain property. Etc. And of course, all those models don't fall in this simple model. 
So then one wonders, okay, can we do something slightly more general? And in order to do this, we consider what are called random bit polynomials. So now again, we consider a random integer polynomial. Now I only assume that the coefficients are independent. So I don't care about the coefficients. Then I look at the bit size of the coefficients, and this is the maximum bit size that a coefficient can take with probability one. So essentially is tau f is like the minimum bit size so that I can guarantee with probability one, all the coefficients of, of f has at most this bit size. Well, this is a reasonable measure and choosing a random integer coefficients of at most a certain size. And this at most this size is the bit size of the, of the random model that I'm choosing. And then there is something that we call the weight, which is just the small, so it would take how, what is the maximum probability that a coefficient they take a certain value. So I look at a coefficient, if it is very well distributed among belly values, then this is good. If it is very concentrated, then I'm very near a deterministic case, and then this is kind of bad. So I want essentially my weight not to be too high because the, the higher the weight is, the more nearer my random bit polynomial to be a deterministic polynomial. Then here it's important to notice that I don't care about the weight of the middle coefficients. I only care about the weight of the constant coefficient and of the highest degree coefficient. So I can just choose deterministically all the coefficients in the middle. I only care that the constant coefficient and the highest degree coefficient are chosen at random with a sufficiently well distributed distribution. And then putting all this together, there is the measure that we call uniformity. Okay, this is a complicated formula, but now I will explain it in the in the in the next slide what this formula means. Okay, so now we go to the main theorem. It says us that the expected cost of this card at a random bit polynomial is at most what we had before, and now is multiplied by one plus uniformity of f to the fourth. So there is this extra factor. So an important observation is that if f is uniformly distributed as before, then the uniformity is zero. So we really should see uniformity as just a measure, sorry, we should see uniformity as a measure of how uniform is my polynomial. If the uniformity is small, then my polynomial is almost a uniformly distributed polynomial. If my uniformity is big, then my polynomial is far from being a uniform uh, random uh, random polynomial. An important observation is that for many cases, this uniformity is roughly a constant. It does not depend on the degree. It does not depend on things. It's roughly a constant. And again, notice that if the tau is sufficiently big, so if tau is bigger than the degree, then this is almost like reading because the d square factor disappears. And then we can again say that on average, the court is almost optimal. But now let's see how this model is flexible because this is the, the important thing. So one of the things that we can do is we can do support control. So I can choose an arbitrary support of my, for my polynomial. Then I choose the coefficients, let's say uniformly at random, and then the uniformity will be zero. So this is pretty good. I can omit coefficients and then I still get and then I still get a nice and a, a small uniformity. I can also force the coefficients to have a particular sign. So formally, I just force the coefficients to be integers with a given sign. And then still, the uniformity is at most logarithm of three. So it's still a small constant independent of the degree. Moreover, I can force the bit size. I can say, I want that this has exactly tau ciphers. I don't want my coefficient to have less ciphers. I want it to be exactly of size tau. And then even in this situation, the uniformity is still at most logarithm of three. And moreover, I can just do combination of these things. So I can choose the support, I can choose the sign, and I can choose the bit size of each one of my coefficients. And still I will get a small uniformity that will be roughly a constant. So in other words, the model is 
very random. So I can do a lot of things to my polynomial and I still get quite a robust model. So it's important to notice that this model is even flexible in the sense that it includes this smoothed case inside the formulation. So if we have a random bit polynomial, we put a fixed polynomial, then we put the magnitude of the size of the noise. Then the polynomial obtained by taking this fixed input and do a random noise perturbation, here the noise is integer noise of a certain size, then this is still is a random bit polynomial where the uniformity is bounded by one plus the uniformity of the previous polynomial plus some constants depending on the maximum uh, difference of bit size and the bit size of the noise. So it's pretty nice. I mean, it has a lot of flexibility around it. So summing up what I said before is again, the card is almost optimal on average. So this is the thing. And now let's see a little bit, let's sketch a little bit how you obtain this. So the ingredient zero is the Descartes tree. As we saw in the example with one specific polynomial, you start at an interval, then you split it, then you split it again. Then some of the branches die out because the Descartes variation rule of science is zero or one, then you do it again, etc. And then the important thing to observation is that the runtime of the Descartes algorithm is roughly the same as controlling the size of the tree. And in order to control the size of the tree, we use control, its depth, so how far does it go, and its width, how we weight it is. So again, in order to control the runtime, we only need to control the size of the tree, and to control the size of the tree, we only need to control the depth and the width. To control the depth, we use condition numbers. So let's introduce what is the condition number here. So in the... In the numerator, we have the sum of the absolute value of the coefficients. This is used to make the condition number invariant under the relations of the, of the polynomial by a constant. And then in the denominator, we have the maximum of two quantities. On the one hand, the absolute value of the value of the polynomial at a given point x. And then the value of the derivative is scaled by the degree. And then I take the maximum of this over the interval minus 1, 1. Then looking at this definition, we can see that this guy, in order to be infinity, it can only be infinity if at one of the points there, the denominator becomes zero. But the denominator becomes zero if both fx and f prime of x are zero. In other words, it becomes zero if and only if f has a singular root in minus one, one. This can even be made more precise in the sense that if you have upper bounds on the condition number, this gives lower bounds for root separation. So if the condition number is small, then the roots are well separated. And then when the roots are well separated, then we get upper bounds for the depth of the Descartes tree. So the Descartes tree will not go very far as long as the roots are well separated. Notice that here I'm not really saying this, is that it does not only separate the real roots, it also separates the complex roots that are around the interval. So it really forces that you cannot have two complex roots that are very near to each other, but they are not in the interval. And then to bound the width, we just have to bound the number of complex roots. This we do using techniques of complex analysis, but the important thing is that we have an upper bound for the number of complex roots around the interval. Notice that here I only care about the roots that are near. I don't care if I have a lot of complex roots far away because I only always have the complex roots. So I have to focus on the things that are near the interval. Then I get upper bounds for the width of the tree. So then I will not have too many sign variations at any level. And then, okay, I have a bound for the depth. I have a bound of the width and it gives us the bound. And then a third comment, which is the probabilistic toolbox, how we can handle discrete cases. And this is thanks to Paul's smoothing. So if you have a discrete random variable, you can always make it continuous by taking some continuous random variable well distributed, and then you combine them together, and then you get a continuous random variable. And the important thing is that then you can apply all the results that you have for continuous random variables. You can use move these results to the discrete random variable. So the trick is you have something discrete, you add something continuous to make it continuous, 
And then you can use all the toolbox that we have for continuous, uh, for continuous random variables, in particular, all the tools that we have for the probabilistic analysis of the condition number. It usually is done when we assume that the coefficients are uh, random real numbers, not random integers. So this is the this is the core that lies at how I can do the transition from continuous to the discrete world. And again, okay, a lot of details I'm being obtained uh, here, but this will be roughly how one saw that the Descartes algorithm is almost optimal. And then let me up end with the take home methods is that to explain the success of some algorithms, we need condition numbers and probability to avoid uh, pessimistic estimates given by the worst case vision. So this is a very good tool in order to explain the success of a lot of algorithms in practice. So let's get a cask of sutra a All right, let's thank the speaker by uh, smashing that reaction button. And I'll stop the recording here.